My name is J.S. Holliday, and I'm proud and grateful to be here. I want to take a moment to speak of something that needs to be mentioned. The leadership of the Bancroft Library. It's a great institution. It's become world famed, so deeply nourishing through the decades. But it has its force, it has its power, it has its prestige because of the leadership of only a very few men who've been in charge. Herbert Bolton, George Hammond, Jim Hart, and Charles Fallhaber. And I, old geezer that I am, remember them, know them all. I knew Bolton, saw him, visited with him numbers of times. I was assistant director with George Hammond, under George Hammond, worked closely with and greatly admired the austere presence of Jim Hart, and now have the honor, the pleasure of working with Charles Fallhaber and the, de the problems, the challenges, the work, the wisdom, the foresight, that the perseverance that has been required of this new of this director, Charles Fallhaber's years, are unequal. No one has faced the problems that he has faced with grace and generosity and ease. He's been amazing. I want to say good for Charles. <laughs> Leadership is everything. And uh, we're fortunate to have had it in, in the past and now in the present. And I remember my years in Bancroft. I was speaking with, with the new the speakers about to come up. And I remember so well the nervousness, the anxiety, the fear, the pressure of a graduate student life, and the professors coming and going. And they, they, I'm telling you, there's fear in life then. <laughs> And uh, I'm so admiring of their success and all that they have achieved. And, I, it's, and they're already published. I remember through the decades that I was hoping might someday get published. And they do it with such uh, elan and such speed and grace. I want to speak first and only briefly so that there'll be plenty of time for their remarks and opportunity for you to ask questions. First, to introduce Susan Lee Johnson. Susan Lee Johnson is an associate professor of history and Chicano and Latino studies at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She earned her PhD at Yale University in 1993. Her book, Roaring Camp, The Social World of the California Gold Rush, was published in 2000 and won both the Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy, and the Western History Association W. Turrentine Jackson Prize. A great honor for her. She is presently working on a critical biography of two women who wrote about Kit Carson in the mid-20th century, and her book examines the relationship between women historians and male historical subjects. There's an intriguing possibility. <laughs> sophisticated. Kevin Adams, I am so enjoyed speaking with him because he is so much a product of this institution and of Bancroft. He had his, gained his PH, his, his uh, AB here at Berkeley in 1997 and went on straight into the PhD program and one earned his PhD in 2004. Those are the years of work and it was Bancroft that nurtured and cared and kept him on the way. He has a book which will be published by the University of Oklahoma Press, which deals with the relations between enlisted men and officers in the post-Civil War frontier army. And Miroslava Chavez Garcia, she is an assistant professor of Chicana history at the University of California at Davis. She received her doctorate in history from the University of California at Los Angeles. Her book, a wonderful title, Negotiating Conquest, the subtitle Gender and Power in California, 1770s to 1880s, was published in 2004 and deals with the role of women, Mexican women, uh, and, and the impact of the victory of the United States over Mexico in the war. She teaches on the faculty at UC Davis. We're about to hear each of these students, scholars, wise people, and I look forward to their insights. Thank you.
why don't we wait with the image just to my initial remarks. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. The title of my talk today is From Big Oak Flat Road to Brokeback Mountain, What a Difference a Century Makes. <laughs> Brokeback Mountain has taken us by storm, and if you've read the New York Times today, you see there's uh, yet another op-ed piece um, about it in today's paper. The so-called gay cowboy movie has provoked such chatter in the news media, across dinner tables, and on the internet that even those who haven't seen the film know the story it tells, and not because they've read the fine short story by Annie Prue on which it's based. Two great-looking guys in the film, not the story. They're just kind of average in the story. Um, anyway, t <laughs> two guys meet one summer in the early 1960s when both sign on to watch a rancher's sheep up on Brokeback Mountain in Wyoming. They fall in love and lust until an early snowfall sends them and the sheep back down to their old lives. Ennis Delmar, the strong, silent one who sees no future for his summer passion, um, marries quickly and fathers two daughters. Jack Twist, the voluble dreamer, holds out hope for a life with Ennis and drifts a little bit longer, but then marries and fathers a child as well. Jack won't let go of his dream, though, and Ennis, try as he might, can't let go of his passion. So they start stealing away together, telling their wives they're off fishing or hunting, turning Wyoming's high country into the most spacious of no-tell motels. Just in case you're among the few who haven't seen the movie and who've somehow avoided all the chatter, let me sum up vaguely. Jack and Ennis don't live happily ever after. What does, and now we could probably have the image. Sorry, that's so small. What does Brokeback Mountain, a film based on a work of fiction set in 20th century Wyoming, have to do with the history of 19th century California and with how that history is documented in the extraordinary collections of the Bancroft Library? More than you'd think. When I was researching the social and cultural history of the California gold rush here in the late 1980s and the 1990s, I spent weeks in the Bancroft reading room poring over the personal accounts of women and men who lived through the rush, boom, and bust that ripped through the Sierra Nevada foothills in the decade after the discovery of gold in 1848. Only one set of papers moved me to tears. These were the diaries, letters, and account books of two men, Jason Chamberlain and John Chaffee, who are on, in that small image there, who came to California from Worcester, Massachusetts in 1849 and never left. Instead, they forged a life together on Big Oak Flat Road, a freight route that linked the supply center of Stockton to the southern mines, the, the gold diggings in the upcountry drainage of the San Joaquin River. By the time the two died in 1903, the house they built along that road had become a sort of way station for travelers headed up to the Yosemite Valley, which was by then a national park. It was how they died that touched me. In 1903, John and Jason both were in their 80s and both suffered from various ailments. John was sick enough that during the summer, a professor friend from Berkeley took him down to Oakland for treatment. John never returned to Big Oak, Fla Oak Flat Road. On August 2nd, Jason wrote in his diary, and I quote, went for mail, heard the sad news of my dear partner Chaffee. He died at 2 o'clock the morning of the 31st, end quote. When I reached that final journal, journal entry, having read 50 years of Jason's diaries as well as the letters he penned and account books his partner John kept, I couldn't hold back the tears. But that was just the beginning. I still didn't know how Jason happened to die the very same year as John. I had work to do. I remembered being told that Jason and John's relationship was connected in some way to one of Bret Hart's famous Gold Rush short stories, Tennessee's Partner, which was first published in the magazine Overland Monthly in 1869. So I tried tracing that connection, which proved simple enough using the resources of the Bancroft. Jason Chamberlain himself had acknowledged the connection in letters he wrote. To make matters even easier, the library held not just a run of the Overland Monthly, but also original records of the serial, as well as papers of some of its editors and authors. 
And the Bancroft's, clo the Bancroft's stacks sheltered obscure local histories of Big Oak Flat Road that connected the fictional story and the actual mining partners, and in some cases, the original research materials of the people who wrote those local histories. I won't spell out precisely how John and Jason are connected to the Hart story, because if I don't, and if you're true 19th century California history geeks, you might actually order a copy of my book, Roaring Camp, and thus <laughs> keep me in print a little bit longer. Suffice it to say that Hart was looking to write a story about a mining partnership, and a mutual friend to told him about John and Jason, who ended up serving very loosely as prototypes for the pair of miners depicted in Tennessee's partner. But if you know Hart's short story, you know that Tennessee and his partner, like Ennis Delmar and Jack Twist, don't live happily ever after. Tennessee, who everyone but his partner considers a very bad apple, gets lynched by his fellow miners. Tennessee's partner, whose name we never learn, is devastated by the loss, and in short order he dies of grief, joining Tennessee on that great Sierra Nevada foothill in the sky. Hart couldn't imagine a world, or at least refused to imagine it for his readers, in which two 49ers could live out their days with one another in the gold country. And so he committed that relationship to the afterlife, where all things, it seems, are possible. Now, I can imagine assigning that short story to undergraduate students swept up in the Brokeback Mountain frenzy, frenzy and hearing one of them say, awesome, it's like the same story. Two dudes try to be together, but the homophobic culture won't let them, and they're stuck with death and grief. It was the 1800s, right? And so Bret Hart couldn't, like, come right out and say that Tennessee and his partner were like lovers. Back then, everyone was so closeted. It was different by the 1960s. People were starting to come out. But the culture was still way homophobic. Gay liberation came, like, later, right? Wasn't that Stonewall Rebellion thing in 1969? So dudes like Ennis and Jack, dudes like Tennessee and his partner, are, like, totally screwed. <laughs> I would smile weakly and sigh deeply and say what profess history professors are wont to say to such students. It's more complicated than that. <laughs> In order to get the students to consider just how complicated it is, how long a time and how tortuous a path we have to trace to get from the world evoked by Bret Hart to the one evoked by Annie Prue and adapted by filmmaker Ang Lee, I think I'd tell her the story of John Chaffee and Jason Chamberlain. And I'd start not in California, but in Massachusetts when Jason and John were in their 20s. The two young men were artisans in Worcester at a time when the Northeastern economy was changing rapidly. Jason was a carpenter and John a wheelwright. But a revolution in markets, manufacturing, transportation, and communications were, was disrupt, disrupting older patterns of craft production. In earlier times, a young white man might learn a trade first as, a, as an apprentice and then move on to the intermediate status of journeyman working under the direction of a master craftsman. He could reasonably hope, in time, to become a master craftsman himself. In the 19th century, a new entrepreneurialism infused artisanal production, opening up opportunities for some to achieve wealth as master craftsmen, while others remained locked in the dependent status of journeyman, which once had represented only a stage in a working man's life. It's in this shift that we begin to see the, we see the beginnings of an organized labor movement as some journeymen banded together to resist these changes. But other men, even men working in trades that were slow to industrialize, sensed the changes and sought out individual rather than collective solutions to the looming portent of subordination. Only women and slaves, such men reasoned, should live out their lives permanently dependent on more, po on more powerful men. When news of the gold discovery in California hit the Atlantic states, men like John and Jason saw their chance and took it. Nothing in the papers the two men left behind suggests that they envisioned living together in the shadow of the Sierra Nevada for the next half century, but that's just what they did. After shuttling back and forth between San Jose, San Francisco, and the drainage of the San Joaquin, looking for the best way to make a living, and around the southern mines prospecting for a paying claim, Jason and John settled down in the mid-1850s at a mining camp in Tuolumne County, near what became the town of Groveland. 
John never gave up trying to find his fortune in gold. He continued to mine for the rest of his life, and even, even as mining itself industrialized, he maintained his independence, working smaller claims, sometimes with others, and sometimes on his own. But mining alone didn't sustain the partners. John, the wheelwright, also made and repaired wagons. Both men cut roads, made fences, and built barns. They hauled lumber, rails, and hay. Jason mined less and less over time. Instead, he sowed oats and barley, grew asparagus and peas, slaughtered livestock, tended grapevines, kept bees, and harvested fruit, sometimes on his own property and sometimes for wages. The men, the men built their own sturdy home and its furnish, furnishings. The house on Big Oak Flat Road stood for a hundred years, and neighbors reported that the men kept it scrupulously clean. As one local historian put it, and I quote, the rude board floors were swept each day with a broom of Mr. Chamberlain's making, and the hand-hewn pine furniture was always carefully dusted with a piece of tanned deerskin that might be found hanging from a peg back of the front door, close to their trusty old shotgun. By 1870, Jason began noting in his diary the comings and goings of travelers who were headed to Yosemite Valley, which brought the partners a new source of income and linked them to the social and cultural world of coastal California. Millicent Shin, the first woman to earn a PhD at UC Berkeley and an editor of the Overland Monthly, passed through and befriended the partners. So did Walter Maggie, the Ber Berkeley professor of physical culture, who in 1903 assumed the sad task of taking John uh, down to an Oakland hospital. Groups of young male travelers stopped as well, and Jason noted each in his diary. The Berkeley boys, the Stanford boys, the San Francisco boys, the San Luis Obispo boys, the Oakland boys. Families stopped too, and even all female parties, such as the quote, school marms from Reno, five in number, end quote, Jason once recorded. All the while, John and Jason maintained close relationships with folks nearby. Old mining pals, of course, with whom they spent most holidays eating and drinking themselves silly. But also young families with children in tow. Miwok Indians who live nearby, Chinese men with whom the partners traded goods and services, married white women who supplemented the men's home cooking with fresh baked goods. The partners attended weddings and funerals, and Jason worked for the county registering local voters. They were, it would seem, respected, even beloved members of a foothill community, as well as sought out hosts for cosmopolitan sojourners from the city. And everyone seemed to know how intimate their partnership was. People headed to Yosemite along Big Oak Flat Road, while they savored Jason's homemade cider, wrote in a guest book the two men kept for travelers. One visitor, for example, referred to John and Jason in a guest book entry as wedded bachelors, while others compared the partners to famous male couples from biblical and classical sources. Damon and Pythias and David and Jonathan were favorite references. In the summer of 1903, when John was ailing, the guest book entries took a melancholy turn. One man wrote of Jason, and I quote, his meditative, absent look and daydreams indicate that his mind, thought, and anxiety are in chaffy while he lingers in the East Bay Sanatorium at Oakland. A love could not miss his sweetheart more, end quote. A husband wrote for himself and his wife, and I quote, Today, we find Mr. Cha Chamberlain here alone and Chaffee far away. Yet in thought, we know they are together. And instead of wishing the old gentleman wealth and prosperity, I simply wish that they might again be able to live upon the old claim together as in the happy days of yore. And then might the silver cord be parted. That kind wish was not fulfilled. In less than a month, John Chaffee was dead. Six weeks later, Jason Chamberlain sat on the front porch of their house and methodically rigged the trigger of the old shotgun with a string that he attached to his toe. A neighbor boy found him shortly thereafter, shotgun between his legs, head half blown off. An old comrade of the partners writing in the Overland Monthly had this to say of Jason's death, and I quote, 
old, infirm, alone, and stricken with disease beyond relief, is it any wonder that he passed away by a short route to meet his lifelong mate and partner? So we've come full circle. The story of Jason and John, like that of Tennessee and his partner, like that of Venice and Jack, ends in tragedy. Now, however, I'm pretty sure I have that undergraduate's attention. Because the tragedy of Jason and John isn't much like the tragedy Bret Hart devised for Tennessee and his partner, and it's altogether different from the tragedy Annie Prue imagined for Ennis and Jack. Jason and John spent 50 years together, openly and happily, and their story of aging, illness, and grief hasn't much to do with what we nowadays call sexuality. No forces of homophobia kept them apart or visited violence upon them. So now I can say what historians of sexuality have been saying for a good quarter century, and the student might begin to believe me. Homophobia didn't exist in the 19th century because homosexuality didn't exist, and neither did heterosexuality. The homo-hetero divide is a peculiar product of the 20th century, and it will be with us in one form or another for some time to come. It's a historical invention. It's a way of categorizing people according to their presumed proclivities. It has fostered emancipation, to be sure. Think gay pride, same-sex marriage, and my favorite TV western, The L Word. But it's also fostered catastrophe. Think the religious white right, queer bashing, and the late Harvey Milk. The world, of Annie, the world Annie Prue imagined for Ennis Delmar and Jack Twist, of course, was all catastrophe, which has something to do with both time and place. But that world isn't entirely foreign to us, which is why we feel so good feeling bad about Brokeback Mountain. The world that's foreign to us is the world of Jason Chamberlain and John Chaffee. That's the difference a century makes. History matters. But it's even more complicated than this, much more complicated. And libraries like the Bancroft can help us sort out those complications. For one, as I've hinted, Jason and John didn't live in a lily-white world. They'd lived in California's most demographically diverse mining region, known during the gold rush as the Southern Mines, where Mexican, Chilean, African-American, Chinese, and Miwok people, as well as various Europeans, lived in great numbers. And daily life there was a study in cross-cultural encounter, from the most benign to the most lethal. That diversity diminished over time through the state-sponsored exercise of white racial power, but it didn't disappear, as Jason and John's Miwok and Chinese neighbors demonstrate. Many scholars, including some in this room, have used the resources of the Bancroft Library to research Latino, African American, Asian American, and indigenous Wests, but there's still much more to be done. Else, we wind up with whitewashed histories that in turn lend themselves to whitewashed fiction and film. A brokeback mountain in which Wyoming's Basque and Chilean sheepmen, as well as male prostitutes in Mexican border towns, remain only shadowy characters. Indeed, I wait for the day when historians have produced enough great books to convince Hollywood that a film about sexuality can also be a film about race a film about class, that Brokeback Mountain can meet Crash, this year's other great Western. These are interconnected stories, and pieces of both are scattered throughout the Bancroft Library. We all have work to do. Thank you. Good morning, as I said again, my name is Miroslava Chavez Garcia, and um, I'll start it when I'm, okay, okay I'll tell you. thank you. Um, the title, the ta excuse me, the title of my talk today is Recovering the History of Spanish-Mexican Women in 19th Century California, and today I'm going to be talking about, um, I'll get to her in a little bit, but I'll just put her up for right now, uh, talk about a little bit of my experience at the Bancroft and in coming, at the role that the Bancroft has played in um, my first, my first um, my book project, which I brought today to share. 
As a child, my family often traveled to towns in Mexico to visit with relatives. Some of the most vis vivid memories of these trips are of my paternal grandmother's family life and the hardships that she had to endure on a day-to-day -day basis. My grandmother had to support several children with meager earnings she gained through the sale of candies and other treats. Times were tough for my grandmother, particularly when her eldest sons, agricultural workers in California, um, could not send money home for subsistence. At the same time, as I learned later in life, she also had to contend with a physically and verbally abusive husband. Though the onset of a degenerative disease relegated him to a wheelchair and later to a bed, she encountered no let up in the burdens placed on him, placed on her by his anger and frustrations. I often wondered how she managed to accomplish all of the familiar responsibilities while she cared for an ill man who treated her with so little regard. My grandmother's life history sparked my interest in studying Mexican women's roles in their family and larger community. As an undergraduate student of history, I encountered few works that dealt with Mexican women or gender issues in history and in contemporary society. This instilled in me a strong desire to know how Mexicanas, like my grandmother, endured conditions of impoverishment, supported large families, survived different forms of abuse, and managed to carve out a viable future for themselves and their families. The decision to enter graduate school came from the realization that Mexican women's agency, that is their voices, thoughts, and actions, needed documentation and further study. As a graduate student, I spent time scouring the literature on Spanish-speaking women in 19th century California. Through my research, I learned that only a handful of monographs, dissertations, and articles have been written about women of Mexican origin in the United States. I also discovered that even fewer works incorporated gender as well as race, ethnicity, and class as categories of analysis. Through this, though this literature was significant, the handful of works describing and analyzing their experiences indicated a need for more attention to women and to their gender and social relations, particularly as females and their families endure the U.S. war against Mexico in 1846 and survive the takeover in 1848. These and other findings ultimately shaped my decision to undertake a dissertation project focusing on the impact of the U.S.-Mexico war on Spanish-Mexican women, as well as their responses to the changes brought about um, by, by the conquest. This is a topic that had yet to be fully explored and analyzed. With the topic in hand, I set out to find sources, archival material that would elucidate women's experiences as told from their own perspectives in their families and their larger communities. As most Spanish-Mexican women 19th century could neither read nor write and left few written diaries and personal letters, I knew that the recovery of women's agency would be a daunting challenge. Moreover, I knew that much of the extent source material was descriptive in nature, that is, uh, providing accounts about what others, mostly foreign travelers and East Coast migrants, said or thought about women. Rarely did we hear, rarely did we hear from women themselves. To accomplish my goals of capturing women's roles in relation to society, I read the relevant literature closely, paying attention to the sources scholars used that enabled them to speak to women's thoughts and actions. Through this research, I found that most scholars cited the Bancroft Library, this is how I came here, and its archivists. Um, several individuals, as useful resources of information in recovering women's history. In Antonia Castaneda's groundbreaking dissertation, Presidarias y Pobladoras, Spanish, the Spanish-Mexican Women in Frontier Monterey, for instance, she makes extensive use of the Bancroft's library's holdings as well as Hubert Bancroft's publications. For her study, Castaneda consulted Bancroft's multi-volume History of California, among other sources, and effectively mined the footnotes for any source material identified in the library's holdings that would or could speak to issues of gender, race, ethnicity, and sexuality in 18th and 19th century California. As Castaneda noted, many of the documents identified in Bancroft's works had been consulted by many scholars, but few had analyzed them with questions related to gender, race, ethnicity, um, and sexuality. Through her research, Castaneda found that women and the ideas about male and female roles and relations were central to the Spanish conquest and colonization of California in the 1770s and 1780s. Spanish, mestiza, mulata, and other Spanish-speaking women in California, she argued, argued, participated in the reproduction and production of patriarchal institutions such as marriage and the family. Her work proved to be essential to my own project, for it provided direction in carving out a research plan a project and ultimately my published book. Another very significant work that makes use, extensive use of the Bancroft Library's holdings and is central to my own work is Virginia Bouvier's Women and the Conquest of California, 1542 to 1840, Codes of Silence. 
For her work on the role of gender, sexuality, and race, and ethnicity in the conquest and colonization of California, she turned to the Bancroft Library extensive holdings on California history. Among the most significant sources she used were, as she notes, the dozens of handwritten oral histories, or the testimonials, collected in the 1870s from early California settlers, including women who worked at the missions, such as who I have up here, Aulalia Perez. Um, she's the famous, well, at least in my terms, famous key keeper or the Yavera of uh, Mission San Gabriel. These testimonies also come from Spanish soldiers and officers and Christianized, uh, Christianized neophyte as well. These oral histories or memoirs are significant to the history of California generally for the lend first hand accounts of events spanning California's Spanish, Mexican, and American eras. More significantly, these testimonies are important to the recovery of Spanish Mexican women's history for they provide insight on women's perception of the past, of their placement in that history, and of their social class and cultural biases. The value of the oral histories, or recuerdos as they've also been identified, has long been recognized by many scholars, including Genaro Padilla and his author of My History, Not Yours. Um, his analysis of Ularia Perez's 1877 memoir, uh, Una Vieja y Sus Recuerdos, An Old Woman and Her Memories, um, in particular, lends significant insight on the possibilities as well as the pitfalls of using sources which rely on memory and are filtered through experiences of conquest and loss. Fortunately, Perez's memoir has been published in its original by the Friend of the Friends of the Bancroft Library and is accessible to educators and students who are interested in learning about Spanish-Mexican women's articulation of early California history. I, I, for instance, have used her memoir several times in classes, and um, I've also used her image quite a bit in my courses and asked students to identify, to suggest who she looks like because of issues around race and so forth. And many times they'll say, my grandmother. That's the first thing they'll say, like, it looks like my grandmother. Um, so it's really interesting, and I love using her image. Um, and her oral uh, testimony in smaller uh, seminars to talk about how women saw themselves in history and what that means. The Bancroft Library also holds an invaluable collection in capturing the range of women's economic, familial, and social responsibilities as well as their familiarity with the legal system as it underwent significant change in mid-century. The United States District Court Private land grant cases, both for Northern and Southern California, are documents related to the Spanish and Mexican land grants, or the ranchos, of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. They document the process through which owners and descendants of these owners confirmed their titles or had them rejected before the U.S. Board of Land Commissioners, a board established by the U.S. Congress in 1851 under the California Land Act to approve the validity of Spanish and Mexican claims in the American period. Rather than respect the property claims of Mexicans, as the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had promised, claimants had to hire lawyers to prove the legality of their land titles under Spanish and Mexican law. In the end, the process proved burdensome, costly, and lengthy for all of the board's decisions were automatically appealed to the U.S. District Court. Ultimately, it took an average of 17 years for claimants to obtain a patent to the Rancho property, and by then most had lost sold or transferred their holdings to some other person or persons in order to cover the cost of litigation. The land cases, though reflecting a sad chapter in Mexican-American history, yield much insight on women's roles in the acquisition and transfer of property, as well as women's roles in marriage and in forging kin and social networks. And in fact, I recall spending much of my time at the Bancroft going through all of these land cases. Um, lots of people telling me, uh, P Professor Elizabeth Haas, I'm not sure if she's here, but t I talked to her about them too as well and how useful they were. These, those records contain copies of original petitions submitted to local officials and governors in the Spanish and Mexican periods, as well as documents of sales, transfers, or disputes involving women's and men's property. As the land cases reveal, when only a few or no documents were available, witnesses, including former Mexican governor, governors, private citizens, men and women alike, testified on behalf of claimants before the Board of Land Commissioners. As the sources reveal, women took an active role in attempting to retain their property despite the odds against them. To, de to demonstrate the kind of insight these land cases reveal, I would like to share the story of, um, of a woman. She's actually the one who appears in the cover of my book. Uh, her name was Maria Mercer Tapia, of how she and her spouse attempted to retain the property that she brought into her family. So I'm going to sh share a short snippet here of, of her experience in this process of trying to retain the property that she inherited from her father. I really love her picture because it's um, so, it's so deep, her, her look, la mirada, as we say, right, is very um, compelling. And this image, uh, by the way, comes from a, a different archive that I have to mention, which is very wonderful, the Seaver Center for Western History at the L.A. County Museum, the Natural History Museum. 
Um, in the 1850s, Madame Richard Tapia and her husband, Vic Victor Prudhomme, were prominent members of California and Mexican society. They held the three league rancho Malibu Simi. Simi Sekit, which Tapia had inherited from her father. They eventually had to sell that land because of debts accumulated in confirming their claim in the 1850s and 1860s. When they submitted their petition to confirm their title in 1854, the Land Commission rejected it because of their failure to prove that the original landholder, her father, um, Jose Bartolome uh, Tapia, had lawfully obtained the rancho from the Spanish governor in 1804. Though Tapia and Prudhomme could not produce documentary evidence of the Spanish grant, they could demonstrate that the commandant at Santa Barbara had given um, her father legal possession of the rancho in 1804. So there were other ways you could prove that you um, had title to this, and not just necessarily to the Spanish governor. Well, as we'll see, this is not play out the case, but there were different ways you could substitute different forms of evidence before the court. And actually, I found the court to be much more flexible than other scholars have sort of argued in the past. That, uh, this document that the commandment had given um, her father did not indicate that the governor had authorized the commandment to take such action. The Board of Land Commissioners ruled the U.S. Act of 1851 limits the power of this commission to claims founded on some right or title derived from the Spanish or Mexican government. But the documents in this case do not show any such concession from either of these governments. The commissioners also faulted them for failing to provide sufficient boundaries or other descriptions of the rancho. As stipulated in the California Land Act, the decision was automatically appealed. In that appeal, Tapia and Prudhomme produced three witnesses who testified on their behalf on their longtime residence on the land, but none could substantiate their contention that the commandant at Santa Barbara had the governor's authority to issue the grant. Nor could their lawyer, Jonathan Scott, turn up such evidence, though he searched the archives of the Survey General and asked family members if they possessed or knew of any documentation de demonstrated the legality of that action. Without such proof, the district court rejected their claim in 1860. In the end, the procedure delays ruined uh, Tapia and Prudhomme, forcing them to sell their rancho to um, Matthew Keller, another lawyer and a real estate investor, for $1,400. And later, the story goes on to say how he, Matthew Keller, actually found evidence to show that uh, the, that this um, that the commandment had given had the authority. So it's a little sketchy of what the details. Um, significantly, Tapia's story is not unique, but rather was common to many of the experiences of Spanish-Mexican women and men alike in the 19th century. In my brief pre presentation today, uh, my goal has been to provide you with a glimpse of the Bancroft's Library's wide range of sources that have been proven useful to me as well as to the numerous scholars who came before me, and I couldn't be here without their work, so I always like to... I learned that in graduate school, <laughs> in the recovery of Spanish-Mexican women's history in 19th century California. Whether one consults the oral histories or the transcriptions found in uh, the land-grant cases, women's actions, thoughts, and expectations can be gleaned and reassembled like the pieces of a puzzle in order to detect a build, in order to build a larger picture, no matter how incomplete or partial, from which to detect and draw conclusions about women and their social, cultural, and economic worlds. Scholars agree that recovering and reconstructing the daily lives and experiences of women who left few written sources um, are difficult tasks. For me, it has been a labor of love. By assiduously seeking out and carefully analyzing rarely examined sources, I have sought to produce a, a study that provides a complex and nuanced understanding of women's challenges, accomplishments, and shortcomings. Above all, my purpose in doing the research and in writing my studies is to honor and recognize the women of all ethnic backgrounds, social classes, and regions who established households, nurtured and reared families, and rose above personal adversity in societies that often ignored, overlooked, and rendered them invisible. Thank you.